As we keep approaching these days of darkness, the book of Revelation becomes more and more relevant and important to us all. I tell everyone, if you want to understand what's going on right now, you need to understand the end first, and then you will see how all the events of today are just stepping stones to get us there. When I see the world wearing masks, it's obviously conditioning for the mark of the beast. When I see a national coin shortage, it's obviously conditioning for a cashless digital currency tied into the mark of the beast. When I see race wars beginning, I see the beginning of the fall of Mystery Babylon. There is so much going on, and the only thing a believer can and should do is stay focused on the truth and try to block out all the lies. When you approach the world from an understanding of the book of Revelation, you feel confidence that no matter how bad things get, as long as you stand firm in your faith, you will be victorious. He gave us this prophecy to prepare us and let us always know that he is in control. This world is spiraling towards hell and we must stay off its path and move the other way. As we have went through this series, we see that the Great Tribulation will be the worst time in the history of the world. The opening of the seals, the blowing of the trumpets, and the pouring of the bowl judgments all bring in terrible events, and it all leads to two events, the marriage of the Lamb and Armageddon. As long as you are alive, you are living towards one of these events. Chapter 19 of the book of Revelation is a wonderful chapter as it begins to describe the rewards for our faith, but it also shows the consequence for those who have none. It has been my intention from the start of this ministry to prepare you to be in this wedding. Before we close out the book of Revelation, chapter 19 needs to be covered on its own. What happens after the Great Tribulation? Let's break it down. Let's begin. Revelation chapter 19. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to Yahweh our Elohim. For true and righteous are his judgments. Because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped Elohim who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our Elohim, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for Yahweh El Shaddai reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of Elohim. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Yahshua. Worship Elohim, for the testimony of Yahshua is the spirit of prophecy. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of Yahweh. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule with the rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of El Shaddai. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great Elohim, that you may eat the flesh of kings, 
the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 21. This is the chapter. This is the chapter that begins the account of our redemption, then the righteous judgment on the wickedness in this world, and our true Messiah's return to establish his earthly kingdom. This is a beautiful chapter, and I recommend anyone that needs encouragement to read this chapter, because it will testify to you that the battle is already won, and what you must do is endure and stay faithful. Let's discuss this chapter. The first five verses of this chapter begin with showing the response in heaven of the judgment of the harlot that was spoken of in chapter 17. This was spoken of in part seven of this revelation series. The multitude in heaven praises Elohim for judging the great whore, the harlot of Babylon, and avenging the blood of the martyrs, which if you remember in chapter seven, which we covered in part three of the series, we saw the martyrs pleading to Elohim to be avenged. This takes place at the end of the Great Tribulation. Through this, we see that the rebellion that had begun in the Garden of Eden is finally ended. Never again will there be more false religions, worldly philosophy, injustice, or unrighteousness. Hallelujah. And we see continuous praise in heaven because of this. We never want to be on the wrong side of this judgment. Now, I love this chapter because of the next part we find in verses 6 through 10. This is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let me be very clear. This is my goal, to be a part of the marriage of the Lamb. I want myself, my family, and you who are watching this to be a part of this wonderful event in heaven. In this part, we see the church, the bride of Messiah, come together with the bridegroom in heaven. Now, I know the rapture is a very debated, controversial subject. I get that. I mean, as soon as you say it, controversy begins. Maybe I am right. Maybe I am wrong. In the end, I don't believe it matters who is right or wrong, as long as each of us is focused on our commitment to our Father in Heaven. If we stay ready and stay His, no matter what, whenever it is our time to be with Him, we will be ready. But this event in Revelation chapter 19 is one huge reason why I believe in it. In my opinion, there is not enough discussion about this marriage supper. Please understand this. The marriage of the Lamb and the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven are evidence of the church being in heaven prior to the return of Messiah to earth. Yahshua is the bridegroom at the marriage and his church is the bride. Let's discuss this briefly. All throughout scripture, you will hear Yahshua being referred as the bridegroom. A bridegroom is a man on his wedding day or just before and after the event. He is the husband to be. Some examples of this you can find in Matthew chapter 9, verse 15, when Yahshua refers to himself as the bridegroom. And in John chapter 3, verse 29, when John was disputing with the Jews, he explained that he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He was talking about Yahshua. Yahshua has the bride. He is the bridegroom. Now, the wife or bride of Messiah is the church. This is his body of believers all around the world, not a physical building or organization, but the collective group of believers around the world that believe in the gospel and live through the word. Again, as John chapter 3 verse 29 alludes, the bridegroom has the bride. Yahshua shows us this relationship in parables like in the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew chapter 25, which shows the virgins being ready for the bridegroom. As Paul talks to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2, he says, 
for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Messiah. And as he explained in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, when husbands are charged to love their wives, just as Messiah also loved the church and gave himself for her. The church is the bride of Messiah. So in this chapter, we see the marriage of the lamb and the wedding supper. Verse 7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. The church has been made ready for him. Now understand this. The word church appears 19 times in Revelation chapters 1 through 3. After those three chapters, the word does not appear again until Revelation chapter 22 verse 16, the last chapter of the book of Revelation. This, I believe, emphasizes the absence of the church from the earth during the judgments of Revelation, through chapters 4 through 18. There is a lot going on in this book, as we have gone through over the last seven videos. But the only times we specifically hear about the church is in the first three chapters before the judgment begins. Yahshua had messages specifically for us. But like I said earlier, this is a debated topic, and I do not wish to debate this. My main point that I will live with until I leave this earth is, always be ready and prepared for our Savior. Always live to be at the marriage of the Lamb. This should be every believer's goal. The marriage of the Lamb is the eternal union of the church with Messiah. The fine linen, clean and white, noted in verse 8, represents the righteousness of the church, which has now been judged and purified at the judgment seat of Messiah. You see, in ancient times, a marriage was a single greatest celebration and social event in the biblical world. Preparations and celebrations were much more elaborate than those of today, and they also lasted much longer. That's why this is a marriage. This provides us with an understanding of just how significant this event is. The same imagery of a Hebrew wedding pictures Joshua's relationship with his church. A Hebrew wedding consisted of three phases, the betrothal, the presentation, and the ceremony. The first part, like I said, is the betrothal, which is like the engagement. This was an arrangement by both set of parents and was legally binding and could only be broken by divorce. It's a mutual promise or contract for future marriage. The church was betrothed to Messiah from before the foundation of the world, as Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We are his chosen generation, his royal priesthood that he has chosen since the beginning. The next phase was a time of preparation as the groom prepared for his bride. As we see Yahshua says in John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Yahshua went to prepare a place for us. Now also the presentation was a time of festivities just before the actual ceremony. You remember, just think about the wedding where Yahshua turned water into wine. Those festivities could last up to a week and sometimes even more, depending on the economic or social status of the bride and groom. We are still in this presentation phase right now. We are waiting to all come together and be presented to him. When you really think of how beautiful this is, it gives you chills. Then we have the wedding ceremony, during which time the vows were exchanged. This is the marriage of the lamb, and then the marriage supper, which is the final supper that we see happening in this chapter. This supper is signifying the end of the ceremony. This is the eternal union of the church with Messiah, our true king. This marriage supper will take place at the establishment of our Messiah's millennial kingdom and last throughout the 1000 year period that is discussed in the next chapters. Verse nine is an important verse. Then he said to me, right, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of Elohim. The marriage supper of the Lamb is a beautiful event and should be the main goal of all of us believers. There is so much debate and scrutiny surrounded by when and how this marriage happens. But we as believers need to move away from the debate 
and live in confidence and unity because either way, we know that it does happen. And it happens before the judgment of the world happens, when Messiah defeats the Antichrist and false prophet and casts them into the lake of fire. So many are focused on proving the rapture real or not, whether it's pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, or post-tribulation. Like I concluded in the video on the rapture, the most important point is to be ready no matter what. You want to be a bride at this wedding ceremony. This is the goal of this channel, regardless of all the debates that people want to bring surrounding the rapture and when it happens. I want you to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb as his bride, as the word says. Please focus on this and read this chapter often for encouragement and to understand what your faith is working towards. In verse 10 of this chapter, John was so in awe of this event, he fell at the angel's feet to worship him, which the angel quickly corrected. Only Elohim is to be worshipped. Now, let's go over what happens after all this. The remaining verses of this chapter are a description of power and the outcome to all this wickedness that we are seeing arise. This is how this new world order Satan is building will end. Verses 11 through 16 show Yahshua, the Messiah, in his triumphant entry with his redeemed saints to make war with Satan, the Antichrist, his false prophet, and the kings of the earth. All those that are appointing themselves as leaders of this new world order are placing themselves in direct opposition to the true king of kings and will come upon swift judgment when he comes for war. Do not think he came to bring peace on earth, but a sword. Make sure you are following after him and not fighting against him. Throughout both the Old and New Testaments, the scriptures teach a literal, physical, and visible return of Messiah to this earth to establish his kingdom and rule for a thousand years. The greatest theme of all Bible prophecy is the second coming of Messiah. This is his ultimate coming. John's vision portrays him as the conqueror on his war horse, coming to destroy the wicked, to overthrow the Antichrist, to defeat Satan, to take control of the earth. Here are some points to remember on this. First, this will be a very public and obvious event. Everybody will see it and there will be no hiding it. Second, he says it will occur immediately after the Great Tribulation, so we know exactly when this will occur. Third, his return will be accompanied by mourning on the part of all the tribes of the earth. All the unbelieving people of the nations of the earth will mourn. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29 through 31 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the power of the heavens will be shaken. Then the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Verse 14 of Revelation says, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Like verse 31 of Matthew 24 says, he gathered his elect from one end of heaven to the other. This army was composed of the church, tribulation saints, Old Testament believers, and even angels. They all returned with Yahshua, not to help him in battle, because as you see, he needs no help. They come to reign with him after he defeats his enemies. They will share in Messiah's victory. This is confirmed in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 and 19. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of Elohim. These ending chapters of Revelation I find to be so awesome. You see, before Messiah was sent to earth, the prophets were given so many prophecies of his coming, and when he came, he fulfilled them all. To see that come together is just so wonderful. Now, fast forward to where we are today, to see all the prophecy that we have been given on these end times, and then see how they will all come together, is just remarkable and a true faith builder for me. To be on the right side of it is my life's mission. Make it yours as well. I keep repeating this because nothing is more important. But when he comes back, all following Yahshua are on white horses. They have white horses because they have overcome the devil. They are washed in the blood of the lamb. They have on pure white linen for the righteousness of Messiah. 
this army has been in heaven waiting for the wrath of Elohim on the ungodly to be over. Yahshua comes down and defeats his enemies through the word of Elohim, which we know is sharper than any double-edged sword. The sword comes out of his mouth, showing that he wins the battle with the power of his word. For the word of Elohim is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. The Antichrist and his false prophet gather their armies to do battle with Yahshua, which means there will be even greater deception than we currently see today, which is really scary. I can imagine the Antichrist lying to the world telling them that they are coming to fight Satan. As soon as Yahshua comes, the world's armies will be without their leaders because the Antichrist and the false prophet are immediately cast into the lake of fire. It wasn't even a fight. The false prophet and the beast were used by Satan to perform his evil deeds. As the two most evil, vile, and blasphemous people who have ever lived, it fits that they should be the first two to arrive in that awful place. They will be there by themselves for a thousand years until the devil joins them at the end of the millennium. Then at the second resurrection, which is the second death, the two will be joined by all unbelievers for all eternity. After the Antichrist and false prophet are cast in the lake of fire, all of the rest who are with them will then be destroyed. Then suddenly it will all be over. This is not a war as we know war today. Our father's enemies will be destroyed by his word. This is not just defeat, but is physical death for those who follow the beast and the false prophet, those who accepted the mark of the beast. The word of Elohim defeated them. They actually die in the battle of Armageddon by the words of Messiah and not by an easy death. This is the battle of Armageddon, and it really isn't even fair to call it a battle. What happens after this, in the next three closing chapters of this book, are really just awesome. But this chapter is the setup for it all. It's something that we should all live with and understand and hope for. Don't get discouraged because evil seems like it is prevailing, because it won't last. Don't lose faith because he hasn't come yet. He is coming. You are assured of this. Don't be worried about the Antichrist and the false prophet. Their judgment will come to them. Focus on not being affected by them mentally and spiritually. Make sure you are not being prepared to worship the beast because you are following this world. The Great Tribulation is a horrible time period on earth. I am not ashamed to honestly say I do not want to be here for it. But what comes after it is the most wonderful period in time. Revelation chapter 21 says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Elohim himself will be with them and be their Elohim. And Elohim will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 and 4. This is the perfect world. No more worries about false leaders, false religions, racism, economic struggles, etc., etc. No more pain and tears, just peace, true peace that only our Father can bring. He has left us his word and given us this prophecy to assure us that if we just continue to rest in him and trust in him, this will be our destiny, our future. Look at the world today. Why would you be fighting to be a part of this nonsense when you are assured of this future? to live in our purpose of what we were created for, to worship the Most High and be in a perfect union with Him, away from the enemy and wickedness. This is what happens after the Great Tribulation. Make sure you live to be a part of it. Be blessed. Okay, thanks again for watching. If this has blessed you, please don't forget to like this and share it with others. If you have not done so already, Please don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Elohim willing, I upload every Friday. Please don't forget to follow this ministry on Facebook and Instagram, as well as on my website, truthunedited.com. As always, let me thank all those who support this ministry. You know who you are. Your contributions are an extreme blessing to this ministry, and I'm very thankful for you. Your support is humbling. You really have no idea how you have helped this ministry. Thank you for being a blessing. Okay, thanks again everyone for watching. I love you all.